our vision to create a people-centered central bank. The vision of the Central Bank of Nigeria is to be the model central bank, delivering price and financial system stability, and promoting sustainable economic development of monetary policy. On monetary policy, we shall pursue a gradual reduction in interest rates. We will sustain the managed float regime in the management of the exchange rate, as this will allow the bank to intervene when necessary to offset pressures on the exchange rate. In order to achieve these goals, we would, one, work with the relevant stakeholders to aggressively shore up reserves. We hope to engage the fiscal and political authorities, as well as other stakeholders to improve our policy buffers, which will further create space for the bank to implement monetary policy using its limited instruments. Two, we would enhance the bank's supervisory purview over the banking system, as well as strengthen macroeconomic prudential regulation by improving supervisory diligence, ethical standards, as well as highest level of professionalism in carrying out on and off-site supervision activities. Three, we would strengthen risk-based supervision mechanism of the Nigerian banks to ensure overall health and banking system stability. All right, welcome back to the program. I had earlier said that I'll be looking at the seven years in office of Godwin Emifili as Central Bank Governor. Uh, we're getting news now that we're going to be going to River State for tackle for the flag of ceremony of Dr. Peter Odili Cancer and Cardiovascular Diseases Diagnostic and Treatment Center. That's a mouthful. Uh, but uh, Professor Ife is with me right here. We will go on, and I promise you we'll bring you that uh, interview. So do still stay with us. Still stay tuned to Africa Independent Television. All right. Uh, Professor Ken Ife, thank you for joining us thank you, thank on, you the for on the program. Uh, Professor Ken uh, Ife is a development economist. Uh, he's also the chief economic strategist in ECOWAS Commission. Prof, welcome to the show again. Thank you very much. Let's get started. Seven years. It's, it's just gone. Seven <laughs> years. <laughs> just like yesterday. Uh, it, I would say just like yesterday, but not also like yesterday. So a bit short is also a bit long, considering quite a whole lot of things mm -hmm. that have happened in seven years. What kind of central banking have we seen under Godwin Emifili in seven years? Well, we have actually seen a people-focused central bank. And what that means, in effect, is that uh, individuals are now important. They are now in the radar. And of course, the indicator is unemployment and employment. So it's, it's, it's being taken into account. MSME finance is also on the radar. And this is deliberate. That's part of his design. And, um, and also, we've seen massive domestic finance intervention, switching resources to restructure the industry, various industries. That also means that development finance is more actively being used to spur growth, to spur productivity, and then to deal with the twin issues of access to finance and also reach out to some sectors where we have neglected, uh, where finance has not been going to. So those, those are very remarkable, and you can see those. But I have to also give credit to the fact that they had to tackle what they met on the ground. And what they met on the ground was uh, a fallout from 2008, 2009 banking crisis, which of course came from America, so prime mortgages, to the point that at that point, Nigeria had about 60 billion more dollars in our foreign reserves and over 20 billion in the excess crude oil. So we had money and this was deployed. We had Amcon that ended up using about six trillion of public to money buy the to baguettes. buy the debts. Yeah. In fact, it, it went beyond buying the non-performing debt by buying many things that it sees. 
and we've only recovered one trillion of those, those, those six trillions. So, and what also happened was that the banks were in serious crisis then. So as the MFLA was coming in, the non-performing loans of some of those banks were as high as 10 to 10 percent to 20 percent. And then, of course, the liquidity ratios were below the prudential guidelines. Some of them were even 10 to 12 percent, but you know it has to be 15, and then the non-performing loan has to be five, you know, according to the prudential guidelines. And so some of these, they had to tackle that. So you had to bring in, you know, uh, risk-based supervision. You had to tighten up a lot of uh, liquidity issues. And then, and even now, looking for recapitalization of the banks. So you had to get the banks fit for the purpose without having major shakedown on the financial system stability before it can now come down to focus on his own vision of the first quarter, of the first uh, four, uh, five years. Uh, so those are major, and even at his beginning, he targeted the yield on, on uh, government security, which was about 18% then, and, and you could now see that it was brought down to less than 1%. And the reason was that uh, a lot of bank resources were going there, and they were crowding out private sector investment. So he had to tackle that, to get that under control. But then that now opened the door for all other interventions. For, so for example, he was very always anxious that money in the medium to long term, the sustainability of our industries and, and the MSNs and all of those private sector depends on how they can access money to the market. It is the market that is the ultimate destination, not just intervention, but market. So he had to drive uh, credit to the private sector through the market. That was why he brought in the loan to deposit ratio, increasing them from 55 to 60 percent and then to 65 yes, percent. Uh, yeah. So and then, so when you right? add the cash reserve ratio of 27 percent, yes. it tightens the grip. So the banks had no choice than to lend to the private sector. He also opened up the vaults and said, "Look, I've got over four trillion of your cash reserve ratio here. You are earning you nothing. Come and use them and lend to the real sector. So at as, nine percent, five years, seven years, and all so." It was sweetening the, the, so they were lending those, and I've seen all over one, almost one trillion now being lent. So in all of that case, it's saying that, uh, well, I can use intervention funds to show that this thing can work. As you can see, it's worked. Over three million farmers have got access to credit with no collateral except their BV, biometric bank verification number and satellite coordinates of their one hectare. So you can see diffusion of fund going there, and you can see organization that has come in that is a restructured, and moved what were we previously subsistence farmers into commercial farmers in our grower schemes connected to national supply chain and international supply chain with strong safeguards and input suppliers of all organized uh, you know, to the modern standard. So mm -hmm. we've seen all that happening. And then we've seen even solid minerals, moving into solid minerals to buy gold and then refine and bring back so that we begin to shift our exposure to dollars as our, our, as our foreign reserve and many others, including in the, uh, the energy sector. So there are, there are push, but there is a systematic plan that is being f followed. We've also seen where SME funding windows were created in the forex funding windows. And then we saw also how the importer uh, investor windows. windows have brought in over $50 billion over one year. So you can see all those, these are systematically designed to ensure that there's a longer term perspective on, on, on access to okay. finance and then protecting the future. And in all cases, has always prioritized resources for the private sector importers, importing uh, import raw material, the manufacturers, because unfortunately over 80% of our manufacturing capacity is tied to some form of import, either import of their raw materials or semi-foodish products or semi-knockdown products or even uh, um, uh, APIs, uh, uh, you know, pharmaceutical ingredients. So all of those, they will, you know, it will take time to shift that base. But at the moment, it's prioritizing delivery of, uh, of Forex to, to that base. Now Whether it's enough is a different matter mm. because we have no control over the source of that other Forex. Let's take a look at, you know, um, earlier on I saw my team did put the picture of MFLA then and now. Can we have that again? You know, <laughs> MFLA in 2014 <laughs> and MFLA of 2021, two different people. Uh, you know, or to the same man, mm -hmm. but do we have that picture? Because I can see it here on the wall. Okay, that's it. So it's for you to take the difference. So we are looking at then and now, how far 
the CBN has gone under a mefele. I have the two speeches here. I had to go and look <laughs> for it again. You know, in June of 2014, I was there in that room. Oh, yeah. yes. I cannot forget that day <laughs> because I think I asked him a, a question which <laughs> was like, <laughs> and he was like, eh, we'll do this, we'll do that. You know, so June 2014, one key thing which he said, which has stuck, is that I want to create a people centered central bank. Yeah. The, the speech, when I looked at it, 12 pages, have it? I think. I think it's 12 pages. 12 pages. That's in 2014. The speech he made in 2019, I was also there. Eight pages. What I'm trying to say is that the Mefeli is not them that has transitioned. When I mean, what I mean in terms of developmentally, that's has it changed from a dovish Mefeli to a hawkish Mefeli? Well, I don't, I don't think bearing so. Bearing in mind yeah. some of the things that he told us in 2014, quite a lot, people-centered uh, uh, central bank, MSMEs, the funding of MSMEs has to be different now. We have to look at it uh, um, through a business approach. Some of the things he also said in 2014, the payment system, which I think Nigerian payment system at this time is very fantastic compared to even some, yeah. I'm not giving credit to them, but that is the fact because so it's quite easy now to do payments. And some other things, exchange rate policy, uh, let me take a look at it again, financial system stability. So in all of this, between 2014 and 29, uh, 2021, dovish to hawkish, do you think so, for Emefele? Not really. I, I haven't seen any major change in his temperament or in his mm. uh, this thing, but I have seen sub substantial shift in the second term. Um, a bit more ambitious because uh, mm. part of the vision is, is, is on, uh, on on inflation figures and, and, and on growth. So, and, um, and we'll have to see how that goes. But in the first term, he focused on bringing technology to improve the payment systems, the technology infrastructure. Bring the, the fin bank fintechs entered into the mm. equation. He created non 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 financial uh, service uh, uh, financial non financial services uh, companies. He licensed uh, bank payments. There's nothing that he has not thrown in terms of technology on the system. So that was actually why in the in the in the second quarter of two th last year. The, the financial system posted 23% growth when everybody was crashing. It was. And then the ICT, of because course, of came to 15%. Because of the payment system. Yeah, you know, yeah. payment system made, they, they were, were making progress technology. even when everybody was shut down. Yes. So they were making know, money. <laughs> they were making money. The banks So it money. was the foundation that was laid. And he continued to invest in infrastructure, USSD, all mm. infrastructure, moving, moving, moving on those. And so that's helping the economy. It's also driving inclusion. Because inclusion is very important. Only 40% of Nigerians are not banked. They are not ba 80 million are not in the banking mm. system. And then 80 million are also below poverty line. Over 100 million are poor. So what that actually showed is that it was actually highlighting the limits of monetary policy in controlling inflation. Because if uh, you know, there was an obsession with inflation targeting in the previous administration, so and then it's, he had to change that. He has to actually no, make but sure. they were also successful the previous administration uh, oh in terms no, of inflation no, targeting. We saw single the digit inflation. Yeah, but the money was there. The, follow, the forex okay. was there. They Remember, had we had over sixty billion dollars on forex, and we had um, twenty-two billion on uh, external. Uh, sorry, um, school accounts. We had, money. Macro, we had more we money. We had macroeconomic So it was in twenty fourteen that, that the prices started the coming decline. down. The man just entered into a baptism of fire when he came into office because everything that could go wrong had actually gone wrong. And then even look at when the 2016, when he faced the biggest crisis because of the, the crude oil reduced revenue by 60%. And then a bank that was receiving 3.2 billion suddenly dropped to 1 billion. And then the, the import bill was 4.6 billion. So it's, it wasn't, a, it's, it's so difficult time for him that he had to try everything. He tried devaluation first, second, third, he didn't touch anything. He tried macro prudential measures, didn't get anywhere. We tried capital account control, we started being knocked by JP Morgan and all these people are reaching agencies, then have to turn to demand management to be able to cut down on that 4.6 billion they are asking for every month. And they'll cut down those 34 items and all the controversy that went with it. And then it's not just restricting resource to Dell, but also making sure 
that you put money where your mouth is. And that was why he had that massive domestic finance intervention to ensure that you can actually replace these products you are discouraging their import. You have to do so. The, the equation changed. And now look at what's happening with rice. We are in a better position in terms of supply of rice. You are in a better position with wheat and sugar and ten value chains. And it's expanding from ten value chains to other value chains. And more people are now getting involved in the southern part of the country in, a, in, in all these presidential intervention. And I've seen the likes of his essay going out, going around and drumming support for oil palm, because all different, different products, cocoa products. Like, so it's is, is, is happening. It's is coming out uh, nicely. But that is not to say that he didn't face you know, severe challenges. So in terms of his, uh, his, the way he has seen the, the growth, uh, in, in the, uh, see how quickly we jumped out of recession last year. It was because of the targeting, the targeting of the resources. If you look at the number of people in my, that have got microcredit from 2014 to now, there are about 500, 584,000 uh, MSME that got access to microcredit. Yes, and I then and then the data. money altogether was 463 billion dollars, mm. uh, not naira. Mm. But look at what happened in the last one year. One segment that is the targeted credit facility, credit facility affected 94 percent of that. In other words, 548,000 of the 583,000 just happened in the last one year. That's the COVID targeted credit yeah, facility. Yeah, it, it hit yeah. them, even though the size of the budget was 300 uh, billion, which is 55 percent. But it went to reach a higher number, many, many times more, which means that it targeted the demand side of the, of the GDP. Because one thing is to put a lot of resources. I mean, there's one trillion going to manufacturing capacity, 100 billion going to pharmaceutical and all that. You create the capacity, but where is the money to be able the to demand. buy and pay for the goods? So it was a balanced approach. And then you have fiscal, the fiscal policy aligning with the Economic Sustainability Plan 2.33. You got that order of coordination and alignment between the two policies. So very quickly, we, we jumped out of recession within one month, within one quarter. So it's, a, it's credit to, to what, what has happened. And I'm sure that he has to also look at how, how he, he moves this agenda forward. Because I've just mentioned one, how we ensure that the southern part of the country are also coming on board and that we are spreading the, the value chains from 10 to more, and then also beginning to link the export ones, because the export ones uh, and the export anchors we'll are the ones that will generate the FX. foreign effects to supplement the imbalance that we have. Uh, and, and then I can tell you that I have seen the IDZ say going around many of the southern states trying to drum up interest. And I have seen that. I've seen so many oil palms. I've seen uh, other, other products in the south, cocoa and all of that coming, coming for even cotton being <laughs> grown <laughs> in Osaka that is yielding eight tons, metric tons per hectare, compared to uh, three, four tons per hectare. If we, if we take a look at- And uh, aquaculture, of course. Yeah. Mm. The unconventional emifile, which we've seen in the last few years, with the unconventional policy of the central banks around the world, not just Nigeria, because I did read a book uh, by Mohammed El Aran, which said, the only game in town, central banks. I don't know if you've seen <laughs> it. <laughs> um, <laughs> Okay, whether I'll, I'll buy it and give to you, I, I promise you that. Mohamed El Aran is the Chief Economic Advisor of Alliance, and I, I interviewed him some months ago during the pandemic. And I was like, why am I seeing this soaring central bank interventions across the world? You see what even the Fed is doing, the US, mm -hmm. the BOE, the B Bank of Japan, even Hong Kong. There was a time they were giving 10,000 Hong Kong dollars to their citizens in the heat of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. What I'm trying to say is that MFLA 2 has been criticized over this unconventional policy. That you can't throw money at everything. Do you think? Uh, no, I, I wouldn't <laughs> agree. He wasn't throwing money. Let me tell no, you but why. That's what people are saying. No, 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 he wasn't. he wasn't. Finance. He was focused on bringing finance through the financial uh, sector and banking sector to the to the reset prof, of the what economy. What I am but asking. Let me explain what, no, let no, me say prof, why it's prof, not prof, throwing money. Okay, Prof, let me land so that you understand. Mm. I've heard a lot of people say it. Even people have told me. So I'm asking that people will say, why not the CBN governor concentrate on targeting inflation? And oh. all of it shouldn't be pro-growth. Yes, that's no, it. No, it doesn't work that and way. And we've seen other central banks pro-growth. No, no, it doesn't work that way. The primary mandate of the central bank is 
maintaining financial system stability, stability and he's got an excellent track record on that mm -hmm. based on where he joined the, the bank when he joined uh, the state of the economy the, the financial sector the second one is price stability and that's why the devil is in the detail on price stability and and then the secondary mandate is to sustain uh, to support sustainable economic development and then of course you know that lender of last resort is part of it mm -hmm. and so we are we are operating a market system we're not command the economy so if you're operating a market system with all the inequalities and imperfections and rigidity, structural rigidities in the economy, you have to look at where are you having market failures. We have market failure in access to finance, to the MSMEs. We have market failure in funding particular sectors like agriculture. You have to de-risk agriculture. And that's why you have to use mm -hmm. $500 million to set up NISA to de-risk agriculture and then begin to make the banks go in there. But it has to set up a lot of other things, credit bureau, uh, 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 depository yeah, collateral system, registry. the collateral registry, mm. and then and then also the movable asset registry mm. to, to encourage uh, uh, le lease and, and higher purchase financing. All of these are to even tractorization services for them to come in. People can't own tractor, tractors, small farmers, but you have to have tractorization services and you have to allow leasing. So the the, the, all these, all these structures, and then of course the payment system, all of them, agent banking, all, all the mix, uh, they're all in the mix. And that is how you now help the banks to actually now lend confidently to the sector. Now, the question you are going to ask me is, why doesn't he take the 600 plus billions that he spent on, 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 on um, Ankobo Rose program and give it to the Ministry of Agriculture to run? But, you know, it is not going to be run on commercial terms. If he's going to do this, he has to make sure that he builds the capacity of the banking sector to, to be able funds. to recover their money. It's not, there's no such thing as free breakfast. Even in free, free town, you don't have free breakfast. So that's why they needed to see the list of the people who are uh, purporting to go and borrow the money, to see their BVN account, to bring enabling law, to make sure that there is global start GSI. So if you don't pay in one bank, they will, they will go for you in all other accounts that you have. Then you have uh, cross guarantees. So the, if you're removing that, that major obstacle, which is uh, um, collateral, you, you have to show other ways in which these banks can get their money back. People cannot own money, put money in a bank, only to see the bank give out that money without, without, uh, uh, by throwing caution to the wind. So you have to do all that, set up those structures and see that they work. Now, there will be challenges in getting all your money back, as you could see from some of the figures, but it's a moving uh, uh, target. All of that are moving target. But the thing is, you, he, he has to make sure that in the end of the day, the sustainability of this infusion of fund is uh, this foundation is built over, over time. Yeah. And the same thing is happening in, in minerals in other areas of the, of the economy, sectors of the economy. Prof, in, in, in MFLA seven years, which area or which areas do you think are the most challenging for, for his central bank? Or what are the sticky points? The, yeah, the most is challenging. The, the sweet sides of yeah. of his The most system. challenging, in my view, is maintaining price stability. Is it and this is because, let me explain. Price stability? Uh, price stability, well, uh, more to do with inflation, yes. Yeah. The reason is this. Always I have all these arguments with various colleagues on the media that it is a matter of money supply. Listen, there are two sides of money supply. There is domestic money supply, and then there is forex supply. All right, we have no control over that. Exogenous factors. You know, one day you wake up, it's gone down by 60%. What you do, panic in the land, everybody. And then you can't control what goes. So, and the thing is that once you have that shortage there, it transmits immediately to, they don't have enough to give to the manufacturers to import their seed. They go to the black market at a higher premium rate, and then they buy, and the inflation passes through. So you've got that pressure there. So there's very little control over that because it doesn't originate, it's not endogenic, it's exogenic. Then the second one is this money supply story. Look at that. You have, you, 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 you tinker with the NPR rates, you reduce that, but half of our country are poor people. 80 million of them are below poverty line. 80 million don't have bank accounts. So you are giving this, the issue is uh, somebody supply to who? To the banks, okay, to do what they lend. They are not lending, but they are not lending. Many of them are not lending. So, you know, well, how far can you go with that storyline? That, oh yeah, it's all to do with money supply, too money, what, what, what. It, it, it's not there, you can't see it. But then, when you look at the, what are the root causes of inflation, discounting the foreign forex related, you see agriculture, 
You see structural factors, you feel the power, the cost of power, you see cost of transport, you see the, the, the impact on transport of increasing uh, petrol price. You know, you see them, and then you go and analyze the figure itself, the inflation figure itself. Core inflation is all indices minus farm produce. And then you see it at 12, and then you see the, 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 the food at 23. Then you look at the, the, mid, the middle wave uh, CPI. The CPI is, uh, is 18. So how do you explain the difference of 10 percent point between core inflation and, and the farm produce? Mm. Now you begin to say, so why is farm produce dealing, dealing with us, holding inflation so high for two years? You find out that the conflict in the four, seven, six geopolitical zones affects everything about food supply. You find out that Nigeria is, is not feeding 200 million people. We are feeding 300 million people. When you add the uh, Niger country. and the Mali and Chad and all these Francophone countries surrounding us, and then you see also some driver, internal driver. Now they, they maintain all these Francophone countries maintain artificial currency. It's artificial because they are paid to euro, and then they, 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 somebody manages their, their, their monetary policy, and then they now bond their reserves to maintain that that rate. So in 2014, one Naira was buying three CFA. Today is only 1.1. So it's like 60% devaluation to them. So they, they make more business buying our raw materials and processing and bringing them back to us to pay 100% price. So they are real. And you, you try to stop them. Well, how can you stop it? They're not paying Naira the dollar when they are buying our produce at the border. They're not paying dollar. They're using Naira to settle. <laughs> so we're not even getting any foreign exchange. They, you can't tax them because they're protected by ECOWAS the Treaty. Was. So you, know, you have very little room to maneuver. So the way the, go the bank responded is to go heavy on supporting the, the, the production infrastructure to make sure that, so how do you explain that we had growth of 3.6% yeah, in agriculture in December this year for the first time exceeding population growth rate okay. in spite of all the problems that we are having with food mm. supply? Mm. Okay, uh, Prof, uh, I think we'll leave it at that right now because uh, we've got to go. The news <laughs> is up next. <laughs> but uh, we'll continue to take a look at it, at least in the course of uh, the week, uh, because there's quite a lot, many other headings that we need to interrogate uh, very well. So thank you very much, Prof, for My joining pleasure. me on the show today. All right, I've been speaking with Professor Ken Ife, who is uh, a development economist, uh, also a consultant with the ECOWAS Commission. That's the much we can take today.